Hey everybody, we are back here at uh, WebDM. Been out a few weeks finishing writing that book. I've been dealing with the uh, back and hip injury and really, really, really wishing I had some of that troll's blood. So in the spirit of that, we're talking about trolls today. Checking them out, what makes them cool, what makes them interesting and ways we can change them. So uh, yeah, hope you enjoy the show. Hey everybody, welcome back to WebDM. I'm Jim Davis, it's great to be back. <laughs> uh, we've been off of our regular videos for a few weeks. Hopefully you guys have caught those uh, live streams that we're doing and uh, yeah, here we are recording another video. It's great to be back, great to be recording another video. And before we jump into it, just wanna give a shout out to our sponsors this year. MCG has sponsored us for like the whole year. It's amazing. We absolutely love what they do. They love what we do. And we want you guys to support them because they support us and they make great stuff for your games. So check it out. We're recommending uh, your best game ever. This is one of my favorite books that they have put out and it like literally sits right next to my desk. There's so many things this covers, not just like, how to run a game and how to deal with different problems of running a game, but like scheduling, uh, campaign arcs, all sorts of stuff are in here, not just for GMs, but for players as well. So it's your best game ever. Why don't you go over to MCG and check it out. Support them, they support us. We love what uh, they do. So go and check them out. Today's show is a uh, bit of an interesting one because we're talking about a monster that is pretty classic to Dungeons and Dragons but is also a little lackluster and perhaps um, you know doesn't quite land as uh, DMs would expect it or the narrative suggests. We're talking about trolls, right? Trolls are an iconic Dungeons and Dragons monster. They're not really drawn much from mythology. They don't bear a lot of uh, resemblance to mythological trolls, but there's this book called Three Hearts and Three Lions, a fantasy book written in uh, 1962 by Paul Anderson. And in it is a creature described as a troll. And uh, you know what, to be honest, it'd be better off just to read uh, my favorite parts to you because to me, this is the defining narrative of the troll. And when I first read these passages uh, in Three Hearts and Three Lions, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> trolls are awesome. Why aren't my troll fights like this? So I wanna read this to you. Uh, these are three passages from chapter 22. And um, just close your eyes. Imagine for a second, you don't know what a D&D troll is. You've never run one, you've never played uh, in, a, in a combat with one. Just uh, listen for a second. <clears throat> the troll shambled closer. He was perhaps eight feet tall, perhaps more. His forward stoop with arms dangling past thick claw-footed legs to the ground made it hard to tell. The hairless green skin moved on his body. His head was a gash of a mouth, a yard long nose and two eyes which were black pools without pupil or whites, which drank the feeble torchlight and never gave, back a, never gave back a gleam. Like a huge green spider, the troll's hand ran across on its fingers, across the mount, mounded floor, up onto a log with one taloned fingernail it, hook, it hooked itself over the bark. Down again it scrambled until it found the cut wrist, and there it grew fast. The troll's smashed head seethed and knit together, he clambered back on his feet and grinned at them. The waning torch cast red light over his fangs. The torso remained. Worst was that task. When Holger and Karahu rolled a thing as heavy as the world towards the furnace heart of the cave, while well, it fought them with snakes of guts. Afterward, he could not remember clearly what had happened, but they burned it. So Three Hearts and Three Lions is the story of a uh, World War II Danish uh, resistance fighter who gets transported back into this mythological version of uh, Europe and encounters one of these creatures in this cosmic battle between the forces of law and chaos. And it's like pretty clear <laughs> that this is the D&D troll. And other than the fact that D&D trolls have hair, uh, it's pretty much the same uh, description. And the description of the troll has been consistent across editions. It's an emaciated, lanky, ghoulish kind of creature. And like, as I was reading the different descriptions across the editions, the, the one thing that really sticks with them is how nauseating and vile a troll is to look at. That its skin seems to move of its own accord, that its 
hair-like growths <laughs> writhe and, and, and seem to be alive. When you start thinking about like all the things that the troll can do and what its regeneration really means, then like, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that like every part of the troll <laughs> is animate and alive. And it perhaps represents a creature that isn't um, a natural living creature, but is instead either some product of, you know, vivamancy or bio sorcery or some sort of alien super science or something like that. And like, it's when I really think about that, when I think about the, the troll as a creature that is ferocious, unnaturally violent, can, can recover from almost any wound except, uh, according to first edition D&D, total immersion in acid or complete burning the body to ash, which is what uh, Holger and Karahue have to do in Three Hearts and Three Lions, I really think of like, and this is an awesome monster that deserves its place, place in the pantheon of D&D monsters. And yet at the same time, I find it's lackluster in play. <laughs> I find that uh, the, the, the way it's mechanized and how it's expressed mechanically often doesn't live up to its narrative potential. And that's a real shame because the fact that it can re just regenerate opens up the door to body horror of all kinds as its blood seeps back up into wounds and its guts writhe like snakes and its severed hand crawls around like a spider as it, and nothing you do can kill this thing until you have literally reduced it to nothing. And like, that's what I want out of the troll. That is the kind of beast that I want to throw at my player, something that they have to think about. They can't just like pour all the, the, the hit points and damage they can into it and then, you know, singe it with a lighter afterwards and it'd be done. I want something that requires them to think outside the box and, and face something truly monstrous and horrible. Uh, and so uh, the rest of the video, we're gonna talk a bit more about how to really bring that out with the troll um, and uh, highlight that narrative potential that they have. Yeah, if you like what we do, uh, you gotta go check us out over on Patreon. We have more than 230 podcast episodes there, as well as audio of our videos without any of the uh, ads and the like. Go and check us out over on Patreon. You won't regret it, and we appreciate the support. So, Troll's got a lot going for it, right? Natural ferocity. Weapons, talons, claws, it can regenerate. It seemingly can survive just about anything other than uh, fire or acid. Um, and as a brief aside, the, uh, the note in Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes about how the troll god spits trolls out that haven't been thoroughly cooked or digested is a really cool uh, explanation for why <laughs> uh, fire and acid are what really kill a troll. That there's all these trolls that their god is just like, not yet. No, you gotta go back. You're not uh, troll enough uh, yet for me. So uh, if you're looking for some inspiration, it's definitely worth checking out uh, Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes for it. Let's talk about the, the real problem with trolls. I have found <laughs> in every edition of D&D that I've played that um, a troll is one of those creatures where maybe the first time you fight it, it's tough. You know, if you're low level, third or fourth level, you might not have all, uh, fire and acid damage that you can do to it, especially the further back into D&D that you go, the less accessible those damage types are. And, and yet, I find that like after that first time you've fought a troll, for the most part, the, the, the shine is worn off. And from a DM's perspective, I have always been underwhelmed by the way that its regenerative uh, capacity is, uh, is mechanized. Right. In fifth edition, 10 hit points around provided that they didn't take uh, fire acid the round before. That's nothing, right? 10 hit points around, seriously? Right, by the time that you're throwing a troll at a party like that, one of the uh, party's fighters might be able to do that with one attack, and they've probably got multiple attacks, and there's multiple characters. So I found that like, the party's ability to outpace a troll's regeneration, to me, undercuts the power of the regeneration from the standpoint of a, an experience of fighting this thing. 
right? Like you want to, you, you want the players to feel like there's nothing we can do to defeat this. Our magic swords and axes and spells are useless against this creature, which is just going to pick its arm back up and put it back on, <laughs> you know? It's just going to like laugh as their swords get stuck inside of it. The real thing I, I think that, that makes a, a troll such a lackluster monster is the fact that because the troll exists and has existed throughout D&D, fire and acid are types of damage that are relatively easy to come by for players, right? And why wouldn't they have them? Why wouldn't their characters have access to this sort of attack, right? Carry around alchemists of uh, acid and alchemists fire, for, at the very least, if not cantrips for them, because you're gonna run into trolls. Because there are monsters out there where the only way to harm them is to deal this particular type of damage to them. And from a world building perspective, it makes total sense. Like, why wouldn't the characters know how to harm a troll? Like, I knew how to kill a Hydra before I ever played D&D. You know, how many people know how to kill a vampire? What werewolves are weak to, right? Like, the, there are things that you can expect that the characters will know because they are living in a world with these creatures. These creatures have legends and lore and the like associated with them. So the very thing that makes a troll terrifying and dangerous, it's kind of baked in that everyone knows what their weakness is. And at some point it's just like, big deal. They're immune or they're, <laughs> they're harmed by fire and acid. Like, so's everybody else, you know? So <laughs> like at some point it's the whole, uh, thing just starts to feel meh. And when you com combine that with just uninspired encounters, the, the troll's not a very complicated monster, right? It's brutish, strong, maybe is good at a little bit of stealth, seems to be able to detect things easily, you know, whether it's keen senses from fifth edition or superior, superior infravision from uh, prior editions of D&D. But it's a pretty straightforward monster. There's not a lot of tricks to it. And once you know that it regenerates, it's even more straightforward. So at least to these uninspired combats where it's just like a slugfest with a creature who might take an extra round or two to kill and isn't particularly exciting. What a waste, <laughs> you know, like what a waste of a great monster that uh, this is how it often ends up. So I, I find that like the number one thing to do when running a troll never call it a troll, ever. I mean, I feel that way with most monsters, but naming a creature by its monster manual name reinforces that you're playing a game, which I mean, we all know, but why reinforce it? It undercuts the mythology. It undercuts the, 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 the terror of this thing, right? If what you just describe is this humanoid mound of something, with skin that seems to crawl as it rises up out of the swamp muck. And you can't even tell exactly where it's looking because it just has these holes for eyes that reflect nothing back and give nothing back, right? You can't tell what it's thinking, what it's looking. And it's, you know, violent to the point of like, how are you even a real creature? Like, do you not have any other need other than to fight? And like, that sort of thing, upping your description of both what it looks like, how it fights, how the regeneration works, all of those things can go a ways towards making it feel like the troll is a mythological monster, something terrifying, that there's a reason <laughs> that people warn you about those swamps, about that weird forest and the dark caves and the like. Another thing is to consider that the loathsome limbs uh, are not a variant, but that they are standard for every troll. Right, the fifth edition description of the troll, while it kind of lacks some of that otherworldly alien terror of nauseating skin and writhing hair-like growths that uh, first edition has, still has some great stuff in it. And the loathsome limb variant to me is not a variant. It's what trolls do. <laughs> they are all uh, like that. Um, they all of them are gonna, you know, have their arms running around trying to strangle you or their feet <laughs> running around trying to trip you up. What does Loathsome Limbs do? Okay, so Loathsome Limbs, right. Loathsome Limbs is a variant feature in the, uh, for the troll that is basically every time they are struck by a slashing or piercing weapon, uh, you roll a d20. Half of the time, nothing happens. The other half of the time, either their head, <laughs> uh, arm, or leg uh, comes off. And then it details what that body part can do. Like, 
if uh, its head comes off, then the troll technically is blinded, but that head, while it can't move, can still make uh, bite attacks. Like, the first thing a troll, I think, would do is try to go get one of its loathsome limbs and put it back on, for instance. Which, to me, suggests to players that if you lop off a leg, the best thing to do is to grab that leg and run. Um, but the limbs themselves, of course, would fight back against that. <laughs> they are animate and alive. And, like, just from a biological perspective, like, what is a troll? <laughs> like, starfish can regenerate limbs. Um, octopi and other cephalopods have their, you know, their nervous systems, uh, you know, distributed throughout their bodies. Like, sea sponges are, you can do all kinds of things with them and they'll regenerate and regrow. But something as sophisticated as a troll that, that, that is humanoid in shape, that has a suggestion of a complex uh, inner structure with organs and all this other kind of stuff, like, I, I, it, it, <laughs> to me, it reinforces the alienness of it. And the loathsome limbs uh, further that, right? And it's, it's, it's using crawling claws uh, for a troll hand. Uh, it's using a, a constrictor snake to represent their guts. It's taking the narrative of what's happening in a fight and then applying that sort of logic to the troll and saying, okay, well, you just hit it for this much damage. Like, its body responds violently to that. Its body is always adapting to the threats that are coming at it unless you burn it or scorch it or, or you know, something. So did you, you know, slash at it? Then it, maybe its blood is trying to blind you, right? <laughs> maybe the blood that's on your, your ax or sword is like crawling up your arm to force itself into your nose and mouth or eyes because the whole of the troll, all of it, every molecule and cell of it, is animate and alive and trying to fight you. And so that I think is where we can really start like highlighting the alienness of it. And honestly, there's a strong case for calling it an abomination instead of a giant. Uh, <laughs> but the other thing about running a, uh, a fight with a troll is um, the other creature that troll reminds me of, which is um, Wolverine from X-Men, right? Think about a troll, heightened senses, claws, regenerating factor, that's Wolverine, right? And I find I have the most fun playing trolls when I just imagine them that they're Wolverine if Wolverine was a slasher flick villain, right? So like take Jason Voorhees or something like that <laughs> and mix with Wolverine and you have this it's like psychopathic killer that nothing will stop. Uh, and, and this is uh, the part of the, the horror of the troll that you thought you killed this thing, but it's just playing dead. Right, if you don't call it a troll, if you never hint that something's going on, you know, then the players walk away, they, they loot the corpse, they leave it where it is, and an hour later it's back, or 10 minutes later it's back, or whatever, right? And like, the more you reskin the troll, the more you use it for other things, the more you take the physical description of it and change it, modify it, and the like, and never call it a troll, then your players never really know what they're dealing with. And like, that mirrors the fact that their characters might not know what they're dealing with either. Especially if you're running, you know, mostly unique monsters, which I highly recommend that you do. So um, that's how, that's just sort of my rubric for how I, I run a troll. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's very fun when you sort of imagine this creature that's like has no regard for pain or physical harm or anything like that. And especially if you're like running your other humanoid type monsters, whether they're actual humanoids or giants or whatever, in a way that's like they like their lives, <laughs> they seek to preserve their lives in combat, then having a monster that's living but who has no regard for its own life is a terrifying prospect. Um, strong case for morale uh, to, to use in Dungeons and Dragons because like, like I said, if you're fighting a bunch of hobgoblins or ogres or something, then at some point they're going to realize they're about to die and they run away and you let them or you capture them and ransom them or do whatever but like they're living creatures running a troll that way really does highlight the fact that this is a different kind of creature entirely and like if you combine that with an environmental factor that the troll while it's not particularly intelligent does have a kind of cunning to it a predator's cunning so why would it fight anywhere where it can be set on fire? Why would it fight anywhere where it can't just wash off acid, 
right? Like if a swamp is the perfect environment for a troll because how are you gonna burn it? It's soaking wet, right? There, nothing around here isn't waterlogged. And I think it's perfectly fine for DMs who wanna like use the troll as is, they don't wanna do a lot of reskinning, to use the environment and how the troll behaves to really make a troll fight interesting. And it doesn't matter at that point what the players know, whether they're using meta knowledge or justifying it in character. If you're just like, yeah, it's got resistance to fire damage because it's soaking wet. It's got immunity to acid damage because it's covered itself in mud and muck and the like, and you can't get through that yet. Um, that those are ways to kind of start making that fight a little bit more interesting, a little bit more dynamic. Um, and it opens up the door for really changing what the troll is and how you present it that uh, to me elevates this monster and makes it such a great addition in the DM's toolbox. It's time to get in the good stuff. To me, the reskin, the modification, taking a simple monster like the troll, doesn't have too much going on for it, and modifying that, changing how I present it is where uh, I find the real value of monsters like trolls and Medusa and Basilisk and all other kinds of the bog standard um, basic d d monsters that, you know, after your first campaign might seem boring, but for a DM, these are your bread and butter monsters that you know very well. Uh, use them as a base to build something new, uh, either as a reskin or modifying it. And conveniently enough, the fifth edition uh, description of the troll provides some great uh, suggestions for what this might look at uh, or might look like. Um, it's worth rereading that section on troll freaks. Um, there's the standard troll might grow two heads uh, after its one head is cut off uh, that they mention. But then there's this curious thing about how a troll might take on traits or features of the creatures that it eats and particularly calls out fey. And just think about this for just a second, because at first it was like, oh yeah, obviously, duh. But wait, a blink dog is a type of fey. And if I've got a troll that can blink like a blink dog, well, that changes everything, right? <laughs> like now it can uh, go hide in the ethereal for a couple of rounds after taking fire damage to, you know, not have to worry <laughs> about uh, getting hit again and having its regeneration shut down, right? Or what if it's got uh, the powers of a dryad? you know, and it has limited control over some of the plant life uh, that's nearby. I'm gonna keep nailing me with uh, acid splash. We're just gonna like have the roots of all these uh, mangrove trees, you know, tie you down for a minute while I go hide. And it's only gonna take a couple of rounds before back up to full health and ready to go again for <laughs> the, uh, the next bout. And so like thinking about the troll as a hyper adaptable creature, and no two are the same is really where I, I end up. And that every troll is unique. Every troll has a different set of powers in addition to its regeneration, representing the creatures that it's eaten, the fights that it's had, you know. I've had trolls that have inserted metal plates under their skin to increase their armor class. And so they sort of have the weird misshapen look of pauldrons and, and hinges on their uh, elbows and knees. And it's like, what? is that creature um, but it's like yep yeah, been cut too many times so uh, right under the surface there is a steel plate uh, that you're gonna have to get through yeah, now they're armor class 19 you know and like those are the sorts of changes you can start to make taking inspiration from Mordenkind's Tome of Foes you can start thinking of trolls as like what 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 killed this troll did that leave an impact on the troll has it eaten another troll like a, a dire troll has and now they're kind of merged and grown together. Um, I like the overlap between zombies, ghouls and trolls, right? Their trolls are already a little ghoulish, a little bit of cannibal in them already. And so like taking that one step further, I think is an interesting way to sort of present a troll as like an overgrown, just grotesque uh, cannibal ghoul. Is it dead? Is it alive? What is this thing? 
Uh, and then, of course, the uh, terror that ensues is the party has to figure out what it is that's going to take to actually uh, harm this creature that seems to keep going no matter what, no matter what you cut off of it. And so, like, looking at your favorite monster and just, like, reskinning the troll or adding that to the troll, you know, trolls with chameleon, whatever, like, those are really uh, interesting ways to present it that help reflect your world present something that's unique, and keep your players on their toes, which is uh, always fun to do. The second big thing, apart from giving them other creatures abilities or reskinning just what they look like, is to change the way their regeneration works. And uh, this isn't something I've done personally. Uh, usually I just leave it out as it is and, and change other elements of it. But having like reread uh, uh, chapter 22 there in Three Hearts and Three Lions and thinking about this show, like, my mind starts going places of like, all right, what if regeneration really is like supercharged? You know, what if they got more hit points, higher AC, and their regeneration is something like, I don't know, half of their hit points every round. And then it becomes a race of like, not just can you, uh, you know, deal fire damage to them after you've worn them down, but are you, able, are you even able to like, beat that <laughs> that super regeneration you know it could be that uh you have actually two uh hit track point hit point tracks and that one of those hit point tracks is for tracking fire and acid damage done to the troll and then the other is for tracking all other kinds of damage and like you they can't regenerate fire or acid damage and so that's worth keeping track of separately but everything else they're constantly re-knitting themselves and so even if you're setting it on fire and burning it parts that aren't actually on fire are still regenerating. That's why it takes burning it to ash <laughs> to defeat one of these things. So those are ways I might change how regeneration works or modify it in some way to present a, a more challenging troll or a troll that uh, is maybe more true to its narrative roots and is less about sort of the, the balance of that individual encounter uh, with a baseline troll. Uh, so, uh, one of the things that, um, comes up in these monster shows are, like, they generate a lot of ideas as we're sort of looking at the monster and thinking about how we want to put a show together, and we often end up with, like, just a lot of, uh, tidbits, as it were. A lot of little ideas and nuggets, uh, that don't really fit into anything necessarily, don't fit into a larger show, but nevertheless could be useful for getting DM's minds uh, churning, thinking about how they're going to use that uh, troll in their next encounter. So I'd like for you guys to sit back and enjoy some of these little tidbits of trolls as we uh, close out the show. So here we go with the tidbits. <clears throat> troll types. Black trolls, blood trolls, cave trolls, crystalline trolls, deep sea trolls, desert trolls, dire trolls, fell trolls, fire trolls. Forest trolls, gray trolls, ice trolls, mountain trolls, demon trolls, phase trolls, pseudo natural trolls, rock trolls, rot trolls, giant trolls, scrag trolls, different from deep sea trolls, slime trolls, spirit trolls, stone trolls, not the same as mountain or cave or rock apparently, tree trolls, troll troll hunters, two headed trolls, venom trolls, war trolls, wasteland trolls, and to go really old school, we've also got thools, troll hounds, and guess what? Knolls. That's right. Before gnolls were hyena-headed uh, people, they were a combination of gnoll and troll, which to me calls to mind uh, David the Gnome Trolls. Sort of diminutive, maybe a little bit bigger than a dwarf, hairy, just sort of mean-spirited little gnomes that uh, nevertheless regenerate and are malicious and the like. So... <clears throat> More tidbits, names inspired from troll mythology. Shadow Walker, Nightgoer, Sunsbane, Cirrus's Companion, Grave Watcher, Sun Swallower, Corpse Eater, Grave Robber, Curse Bringer, Bone Grinder, Joy Killer, Curse Bearer, Devourer, Chewer, Swallower, Eater, they're really cool names uh, from some of the uh, <laughs> troll stories. My particular favorite uh, absolutely has to be Joy Killer. <laughs> and uh, Grave Watcher uh, is another one that, uh, that I really like. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, some of my favorite trolls uh, are uh, my character Slain, 
Uh, it was a Trollkin in Midgard Press. I think Trollkin uh, from that setting are really interesting because they're taking the concept of trolls, right, and then making them playable. Um, there's two or three types of them. I was playing one of the uh, the, the spiritual ones, ones that's uh, got the name of them actually, but it's essentially Nightwalker. Uh, and the character himself was like, I want it to be the boogeyman, but for bad guys, it's really cool. And I think if you're interested in trolls and want to find a way to like make them playable, allow uh, that the, some sort of narrative potential for players, checking out uh, Cobalt Press's Trollkin is the way to go. Um, apart from the, uh, the troll in Three Hearts and Three Lions, my other favorite troll is the Bagman from uh, Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. And I think it really highlights how easy it is to reskin a monster and turn something that's very boring and plain and kind of one note like the troll into something that can be really terrifying and cool. And I like absolutely love that monster uh, and have not had a chance to use it, but you can be certain that it will make an appearance uh, in my next 5e game. Some other things to think about are things like, what happens when you eat troll flesh? You know, um, in Warhammer, I'm thinking of Grom the Paunch, right? That's this goblin that eats a bunch of troll flesh and then it just like keeps growing and growing and growing inside of his stomach. And it becomes like this giant, monstrously obese goblin that then is a warlord that invades uh, the High Elf Island. And it's stuck with me. I probably read that when I was like 11. And the idea of like eating troll flesh and that changing you, could you take on some of those regenerative capacities? Is that how trolls are made? Right, like, can you think about like, you're a group of adventurers, you know, you're in the middle of some dungeon, you're, you're far from home, one of your party is dying, and you don't have uh, the spells or resources or whatever, you just killed that troll, right? Like, like, it was a hard fight. Maybe if we cut out its heart and fed its heart blood to our dying friend, it would gain some of that regenerating capacity. Maybe, it seems like a great idea until you realize you've just created a new troll because anything that a troll <laughs> inhabits becomes a troll. And I really like that idea. I, I love a monster that like did, wasn't born a monster. They were a person, they were a commoner, a regular old <laughs> fantasy uh, world, uh, Joe and Jane Doe until something terrible happens to them uh, or they run across someone and they're cursed. And the idea that like, we had to do this, we had to save our friend, a troll regenerates, we, he needed a new limb, or, or you know, whatever it was. And that's good intentions comes uh, more trolls. So I think that's pretty cool thinking about it, like what happens when you eat their flesh or drink their blood, I think is really interesting. Uh, and having it change adventure is really cool. Which leads me to my next point, which is troll organ implants and limb grafts. Like, to me, this is obvious, right? Like I think, I see myself as thinking like, what if there's a troll who put the brain of a surgeon in their body, right? Like they took out their own brain and they're like, I hate this troll brain, it's stupid. And I put in another one <laughs> and the troll regeneration sort of takes over, incorporates that in them. And now we have like a troll surgeon who's doing organ transplants, skin grafts, limb grafts. Uh, these could be magic items, things that uh, you give to your players. If it doesn't turn them into a monster, maybe they just make themselves into a monster because that's the kind of D&D &D they like. Um, but I, I really haven't been able to get that image out of my head uh, for a while. And then next to that is one, let's say a troll chef, you know, cut off a little piece of themselves, grill it up, serve it. It's great. It just regenerates from them. No, it just really costs them like nothing. And yet uh, they're able to feed the whole neighborhood, the whole camp, whatever it is uh, with that. And um, I think if you're playing in a world where alignment's out the window and all the monsters are kind of like mixed in with everything else, then those are really interesting ways to think of, uh, of trolls. And um, yeah, I think I mostly just, uh, I love them. I really think that they're interesting. They're, they're one of my favorites. They're unique to D&D. They're not like anything else, you know, they don't turn to stone and sunlight. They're, they're not taken from Tolkien. They're, they represent an influence of D&D that, that I find refreshing. And that's, that's why I don't think I've, I've ever really given up on the troll, despite the fact that like a lot of times when I fight them or run them or, or even play with them, there's like, oh, it's a troll. But I never want to forget that when you fight a troll, you're going to have to fight every part of its body as it slithers, scuttles, and worms its way across the floor to try to kill you because it's a troll. And that's just what trolls do. See you guys next week.
tidbits. 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 It's a tidbit. It's just a little bit. It's just a tid. Like a little bit and then a tid. There's not that much of it. It's just a tid. If, if it was more, it would, wouldn't be a tidbit. It would just be a bit. But a tidbit, smaller than a bit. You know? Speaking of that, you have to cut a troll into tidbits in order to pile them up high enough. Not together, mind you, because then they'll just form another troll. You have to have a separate fire for each one of those little tidbits of troll. Otherwise, you're going to just get like a hundred trolls or one big one that's really pissed off. So you want to take a tidbit one at a time, take it, eat it. You wait until it's digested because you don't want to put another one in there while it's digesting. And then you're done. You have your tidbits. You've eaten, now you're full, troll stat. That's what a tidbit is.